Well, I'm going to do a cardiac intensive care nurse speak on And um, I went to UConn, graduated, went to Hartford Hospital, worked in the step-down unit, went to Georgetown University to work in their unit. And like one day, I went to a book sale at the State Department and got a book called Medicine Under Capitalism by Vicente Navarro. And in that, it talked about um, how the kids in West Virginia have a very low vaccine rate. And at Georgetown, at that very moment, they were, they were um, buying a um, EKG that would print out a, a reading every minute on the patients that were in that 19-bed unit. And I had a, just an unbelievable shift in what I knew I was meant to do. I was no longer meant to do one-to-one, -one, but felt I needed to one-to-many. So I learned a lot in nursing school, but realized that I didn't know anything about public health. And so worked full time in, George, in um, Johns Hopkins Hospital as a float nurse and went to school full time to get a degree in international public health. And then I went to Haiti and cried the entire time I was there because I didn't know the language, the diseases, the culture, and people were so poor. They were dying in front of me and I had no experience at all with this kind of trauma. I said I'd never go back. And then um, my dad said to me, you know, before you go to work overseas, you really need to work with the poor in your own country. So I said, okay, I've got a job in Norwich working at the soup kitchen and opened Madonna Place, which is, which is a place for um, women on state assistance for unconditional positive regard. And it's still operational now since 1981. Anyway, I went with Dr. Lowney, the president of HHF, to Haiti in 1982, um, and then just kept on going. I started teaching at UConn, brought students down, a couple of whom were my, my roommates in college, Bobby Horn, who's, uh, I think she retired now. She's not around anymore, right, Bobby Horn? Anyway, some nursing faculty and uh, my you know, colleagues came down, and I wrote a grant, never having written a grant before, on the request of Dr. Lowney for public health. He said, well, well, you know, we'll give some vaccines. So we were funded in 1987, and um, the rest is history. But as we get to um, public health, I know you learn a lot about um, technology and how important technology is in your role as nurses and on as nurse practitioners or whatever you're going to do. These are probably the most important things that a public health nurse in the third world has to use. And these things will save thousands of lives. So um, the first is vaccination. You know, we sort of think it's important. But we've gotten to the point where women in the third world will know what the vaccine is and when it's due. And will walk three or four or five hours with their children to get vaccinated because they've seen children die of polio, you know, I, we've just seen whooping cough again. I had whooping cough because I didn't get my booster. That was no fun. Um, and, you know, such and such. So we're, it's very important, as well as tetanus vaccine for girls and women. Because what happens in Haiti is a umbilical cord is cut with a dirty knife or a piece of um, tin, and the baby will cease to death with neonatal tetanus. And having seen that once, whenever the mother cried, the baby seized and died. So um, vaccine's extremely important. This saves millions. This little teeny pill. You know we blow off vitamins in the States. You know it's a big business. You know, do you really need vitamins versus not? You have fortified food. But, um, you know, something's not just blow Vitamin A. It was discovered not too long ago by Johns Hopkins researchers that one capsule of vitamin A every four to six months will prevent a child from going blind in the third world from xerophthalmia. Their cornea actually explodes. And not only does it prevent, in, even with a child who's malnourished, if they have vitamin A on board, because it, um, it helps fast-growing cells. So it helps with pneumonia because of the fast-growing cells in the lung. Helps to prevent, not prevent, but helps to mitigate against diarrhea because of the fast-growing cells in the gut and certainly the eyes. So it is so important that we track every single dose of this one vitamin to every single child that we need. And it takes only one of these every four to six months from six months of age to five years to prevent blindness. I mean, how could talk about one for the many. 
simple, free, comes from UNICEF. Okay, next, clean water. We are so lucky. When my daughters were five and three, we went, we landed in um, JFK, and um, we were really tired from the long journey, and we went into the bathroom and washed our hands, you know, and I cut my hands to drink the water, and my daughter said, you can drink water in an airport? And I said, you can drink the water anywhere. And they just couldn't believe it because we're constantly thinking about where is our water? Where is the clean water? Am I going to get diarrhea from this? And they just said, no. You can drink the water anywhere in America? And I said, pretty much. So clean water. In Haiti, it's not the same. Because of, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start my talk yet. I, because of cholera, it's really important to establish that all families have clean drinking water. And what that takes is just a dropper, five drops of Clorox, and a gallon of water, and that's it. It will kill the, uh, the Vibrio cholera. So what we're doing is getting 20,000 little you know, medicine containers and droppers, and people go to the market and buy this and use it in their homes. <coughs> Same cool. Same lives. And or rehydration <coughs> is Pedialyze. But even that's expensive, and here you just you know get it from UNICEF, or you can buy it. We prefer to make it with uh, three tablespoons of sugar and one teaspoon of salt, and some drops of um, lime juice, and that will save your life because you don't die of diarrhea, you die of arrhythmia. Okay, I'll get to this a little bit later. Oh, one more I have to do. Medicine cup is probably one of the most useful tools that we have, right? Because mothers in Haiti have to go to work, they have to go to market, they have to live their life outside of the home, and they don't bring babies with them like they do in Africa. So this cup is given to every mother of a new baby so that she can express breast milk. And you can feed a baby a newborn with a cup of milk that's expressed from the breast. And then one of the most difficult things to work with in Haiti is that when women in fact are poor and malnourished, they're hungry and they're thin, and so they'll say to me, I can't breastfeed because I don't have enough milk. I, don't, I just can't do it. I don't have enough in me. This is, oops, I screwed up. This is a belly ball. And that's the size of a newborn. It's a marble. That's the size of a newborn baby's belly. So we'll say to women, I think you could probably squeeze out enough colostrum to feed your baby. I'm like, is that all? We thought it was bigger. Then three-day-old three day baby. Is that the, the shooter? And they're like, what? We, you know, we can do that. We don't have to get formula. And this is um, a 10-day old baby's belly. So we get over that fear using very concrete examples. And that's what nursing does. And nursing does really well. Is we figure out what's going on and then find, find really logical, creative, and practical ways to teach people um, as they teach us. <laughs> how to, how to um, take care of ourselves and our children. Now this is the, the coolest. This is really the coolest. You know, you Most babies are delivered at home in Haiti. And gloves are an interesting commodity, but not something you can get everywhere. I would suspect that the most, most of the babies in Haiti are delivered with gloves that are garbage bags. Protects the midwife, protects the mother. Everybody's clean. I never look at garbage bags the same anymore. That's what we use. Okay. Now, let me go. I'll talk to you later. Now I have to do something. Can you pick up in here? Yeah. At the screen?
Devin Root graduated from UConn, what, two years ago? Four years ago, sat right in this chair and uh, came and worked with us for a year and we're happy to say she will add, be able to add to this presentation because she used the nursing uh, that she learned here at UConn and, and we worked very closely. And Marissa Goodnight is, uh, was an English major. She came and worked with us as a very, very important um, volunteer for the women's programs and um, convinced her, did some studies while she was in Haiti, convinced her to go back and be a nurse. So she's now in the master's program, right? Yeah. So if you have any question about what it's really like, you can talk to them. So on we go. So this is basically what we're going to talk about. Um, if you have any questions, really burning questions, you don't want to wait till the end, shoot your hand up, no problem. Okay? We only work in Jeremy, Haiti, and it's, um, we've only been asked to go to other parts of the country and actually to South Sudan. We, we choose to work in great depth and breadth in this part of Haiti rather than spreading it around. But in fact, at least 40 organizations have come to learn from what we've, what we've accomplished and go and adapt it in their own areas. Dr. Jeremiah Lowney is an orthodontist in Norwich, Connecticut, who had cancer. And when his cancer went into remission, he pledged to spend the rest of his life and his money, and everybody else's money, uh, to serve the poor. And then started pulling teeth in Port-au-Prince and met Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who said, you really have to go to Jeremy, there's a great need out there. And as he says, you, can, you can't say no to Mother Teresa. So he did, and I, I was invited to come along um, as the public health director. There are some key features that make this program work so well, and one is that it's not a medical model, it's a nursing model, it's a public health model. It's from the ground up, and not from the top down. In fact, we only had one doctor for the first 10 years, because what kills people for the most part are not things that require medical intervention. They require good education and simple technologies like I showed you. The second is relief is balanced with development. We are currently and will be for a long time in relief mode because of the earthquake, the, earth, um, the hurricane, and cholera. But you try to keep in balance the movement forward of people to take care of their own and their being able to eat themselves. Uh, oh, and the third one is um, um, objectives and relationships. Haitians and many people in non-Western culture value relationships, and that's the most important thing. Whereas in America, it's the bottom line. It's the objective. It's the behavioral objective. It's what can you prove, what can you see, what did you write. So it's balancing those things. And when you get a lot of money from USAID or foundations, you've got to prove what you've been doing, so you have to learn to balance those two things. Haiti is comparable only to Sub-Saharan Africa. It's in pretty bad shape, very small. Condi would still for cocaine. And when America went down um, in its economic uh, situation, you can imagine what it did to all those Haitians who were sending money back home as they do in many countries, um, so lots of people are suffering. Whatever happens in America happens worse everywhere else. The life expectancy is 59. That doesn't mean that people die when they're 59. It means because so many babies die, it shifts that statistic over to the left. So if you don't get tuberculosis or HIV and don't die in childbirth, you live to be very old because there's people smoke maybe a cigarette a month. They drink, but you know, not as much as we do, I don't think. Um, so people really live to be a long time. You see, the infant mortality rate, um, most children who die under the age of one is a crime. Uh, it was 150 per thousand when I first got there. Family planning need is great, and malnutrition is getting worse. That's really depressing. So we can do as well as I can. So the Human Development Index, which looks at um, literacy, longevity, I think, and women's education, I think, puts Haiti way down there with Sub-Saharan Africa, so, um, you know, it's Africa, it's poor Africa in our backyard. This is one of those things, oh it does. So this is, this is Port-au-Prince, you fly into Port-au-Prince, that's where the epicenter was. And you take a boat all the way out here for 12 hours, or, you know, in not very good conditions with about a thousand other people. Or drive down to the Kai and then come up to Jeremy, and that road's being built, or you fly like I do, and it's a 45 minute flight on a small, a small plane. The service area is huge, but it's not huge in terms of square miles, because we only measure in walking time. 
So to get from our clinic to the furthest village where we serve is a 14-hour walk. Long way. The Grand Dance is a, is a state, and this is the Jeremy with a seat of this department. And there are many rivers making work difficult. It's about 50,000 people and 400,000 in the area. This is a group from New Hampshire, a group of nurses and doctors um, going up the mountain on mules, and they stayed overnight. Mules are actually ambulance, a way to portage medicine up to the village and to get health providers up there as well. People work extraordinarily hard to survive. Yeah, you have blizzards, we have rivers. So we're happy to have these snorkel cars. You know, they have the water, water filter, water filter, air filter, way up here so we can go up to the engine uh, through the rivers and not worry about um, breaking the whatever, block. So we come out the window, swam across, did all our health care, and then swam across the river to go back, you know. So but it's a great challenge. You might have been pregnant and in labor and in crisis trying to get across that river. This slide is important for many, many, many reasons. One, this is the fishing fleet, so there's no, there are no big boats. The big boats that were there went out with boat people, and so they're not there. Number two, um, if you put down a fishing trap like this and pull it up in three days, you're getting what little fish there are, and this has health implications, of course. And if this tether breaks, it keeps fishing. So you're losing all that protein uh, at the bottom of the sea. And number three, it's children who are going close to the shore in dugout canoes. You really feel like you're in you know, colonial times. And um, it's tough. But when we can, we get yellowfin tuna, mahi-mahi, king mackerel, conch, stuff like that. But because there's not enough animal protein to feed the people, this has, you'll see what the health effects of that are. Haitians eat an average of one meal a day, about 1,200 kilocalories, and um, many are stunted. A large proportion are um, um, very, very low weight for age. The products of Haiti, however, were enormous during the colonial period. Coffee, that's chocolate up there up in those pods. Tastes like a sweet tart. If you chew into it, it tastes like a lavender crayon. So it's, you know, the next time you want to eat raw, <laughs> that's what it's like. And the one on the other side is drying cacao. So it's a major product and really worth a lot in the world market, but the Haitian peasants get 20 cents for a pound, a pound of raw cacao. The other is sugar cane, which is uh, acre per acre, the most important thing to grow. And um, manioc and other root crops. Now, Haiti, you know, by all means, should be desolate and dead because whatever it was growing in balance went away when they were taken over as slaves. Everything that was planted was to feed the slaves, and everything else was shipped off to Europe. So it's a tough situation. The traditional healing system is so interesting, I can't even tell you. We have herbalists that we work very closely with, bone setters who are a type of herbalist, um, voodoo priests and women voodoo priests who are mambo, and many of them deliver babies. So it's, you know, one cannot uh, work closely with the people that are already there and community leaders. Besides, it's just really interesting. Um, if you have any stories about any of this, you can. You know, um, so for us to come into a culture knowing the biomedical um, things about anything, you know, really doesn't matter. You know, when doctors come in all the time and say, what do you think? You know, there's a, there's a, a malady called biscuit tombe. Biscuit tombe. Biscuit tombe is when your xiphoid process falls down. Now, do you think your xiphoid process is going to fall down? No. But that's what happens, and this treatment is to go to an herbalist and have three days of rest and get massages and teas until it gets back up into its position. Well, it's a mental health day. So a doctor will come to tra your translator saying biscuit tombe, saying he has a stomach ache. So anyway, there's lots of those challenges. Also, we work closely with voodoo priests in terms of cholera and also AIDS because there's a belief that it's a voodoo, a voodoo curse and that um, if you get uh, AIDS, it's not your fault, nor can you spread it. So that's like not good. Um, so we have a lot. I can talk a lot about that. In Creole, we say, show the ashitasu pua wujibife. It takes three rocks to hold a cooking pot, three legs to hold a stool. And for us there in Jeremy, it's um, the community of people, the community of providers, and the donors. And that's what keeps us going for all these many years and many years to come. The community of adults, 
Um, that sh that um, slide on the bottom right is uh, some of the students that are put into school by a sponsorship program of HHF. On the bottom also is uh, soccer, which okay. The providers are 95, 99% Haitian from the local area. There are very few of us who are paid. Sister Mary Ann has been there from the very beginning. She's a nurse who worked in China, worked with lepers in India, speaks several languages, and she's from the Show Me State. So she's kind of awesome. She does a pretty great job. The guy up there on the upper right, yeah, all the, yeah, the left, is Casimir. He is an LPN. We're going to found him. Just got out of school. Finished school and went full time, then went to law school, and so he's an attorney and a nurse and my assistant, and that's how far he's coming. Um, providers that treat and prevent fabulous dentists, 80% of what we do is education. We welcome all kinds of dentists and dental students with their professors from UConn as well. We have 180 staff. We have donors from all over, individuals, the woman up there. On the upper right is Karen Cole from Manchester, Connecticut, who donated our very first mule ambulance in 1988 as part of her church group. Um, USAID, you know, people can say whatever they want, but they funded us without end from 1987 onward to cover 200,000 people. Um, you know, well, Catholic Relief Service, Cross is in Florida, AmeriCares is in Stanford, um, and lots of groups come, and the Hilton Fund for Sisters. We do not do medical tourism. We don't promote any kind of developmental tourism, which happens a lot, and especially since the earthquake, but rather try to develop um, a strong infrastructure with local leaders, community leaders, and organizations for sustainability. And that's really, really important. A lot of times people, you know, hook up with some pastor or priest or person and go whip it into a village and give a thousand dollars worth of medicine and whip out and come back the next year. So people will say to us, well, why don't you do the same thing? I said, you want it once a year? Or you want it all the time? And they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. So the government's pretty weak. During my dissertation period, there were 11 ministers of health in three years. So it's a bit unstable, to put it mildly. The Clinic of the People of God was built with private donations, a lot from Mystic uh, Color Lab at that time. We started with 28,000 people, and we stopped at now 200,000 plus. It's an enormous amount of people to take care of, but we do it in a very, very well-organized fashion. <coughs> Education is 80% of what we do, and um, this uh, woman that with the mouchoir had the handkerchief on her head is um, play-acting, a nurse, a nurse, a midwife in a delivery and home, and how to uh, do all of those skills that will prevent a woman from dying of a hemorrhage. So it's called home-based life-saving skills, and the College of Nurse Midwives uh, helped us to be the first organization in Haiti that actually gives villagers the skills and the techniques to do first response. And so, again, all these pregnant women who will deliver by them, 13% deliver by themselves. I'm the director of the community-based primary care program. The man here is a, a village health worker who was selected by his own people, trained by the government, and he takes care of 4,000 people, and he has a sixth grade education. They do everything. And, of course, to work um, in changing behavior, ultimately, we work with grandmothers as the holders of the culture. <coughs> Fathers have very little engagement in Haiti um, with childcare, as they do in the States as well. So um, a doctoral dissertation that was done out of the School of Anthropology here, um, Robin Devin, looked at mother's work and child health. And one of the significant findings was that men knew nothing about child nutrition. And so we started doing um, fathers clubs for family health. And um, it's, it's really wonderful for us to see fathers who can name the vaccines, who bring their kids in for vaccines and, um, you know, stuff like that. We keep, we're the only organization that anybody knows of that's completely computerized. So I know exactly who's where, how many kids are there, how many kids are malnourished, and if they're vaccinations. So this is just, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is one village, okay? So this 78 is 24 months old, who's of normal weight, has all his vaccines, there's the vitamin A, 
three doses, track every dose, like I said. The two major causes of death in children are diarrhea and pneumonia. We trap all of that too, and now we've added cholera. That's children. Women, we track all women 15 to 49. Their vaccines, their birth spacing, their family planning method. This one was using the LAM method, now she's using Northland. Deborah Provera, this 44 year old, this has sterilized. You know, so, that tubal ligation. So, um, so it makes public health concrete. What most people do is they want to see a building or a car or a, you know, something that they can see for health care. But in public health, they don't see it. It's a process. So by doing this, it's made it uh, alive. And using local talent, we put it all on the computer. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Move along? Great. You tired? Keep going? All right. Another key feature, and this comes from nursing, this comes right from nursing, is feedback to people who are beneficiaries. Most often people do things to people, but they don't engage them in what it means, or where it went, or how we can make further changes. So there's Casimir, I mean, there's a flatbread in Haiti called a Casab Douce, and um, everybody, whether they're literate or not, can understand a proportion of that bread. So we'll use apply diagrams to demonstrate vaccine rates or what things were before and what they are now and then say to the community so how are we going to get this done together an example of that is um, we were having a hard time getting women vaccinated for tetanus uh, tetanus toxic. so we wanted to show that the rate was kind of low and so the community leaders said oh that's easy just do it on a sunday after church and you'll get everybody and so we did and we did. And then we got like 95 percent vaccine rate. So it's working together with people rather than at them, which is never a nursing way anyway. But it's, it's amazing how critical that approach is and feedback and planning. Of course, the issue of all of us is to train and step back and build a capacity to be of others um, so that they can manage the health care of Haitians. And we're very happy to say we work with nursing students, um, a lot of our people have moved up in terms of job and education. And personally, I'm very, very happy that mothers clubs, uh, mothers will go to other villages and train mothers. And this was critical after the earthquake. And now we have a judge in Geneva who was part of the sponsorship program that would not have gone to school had an age job not been there. So that brings me to this, this um, book, which I just started reading. So I'm prepared to say I'm finished. But it's called... One illness away. And I said, oh, I'll do that. I'll do it. One illness away. It's written by an economist, a leading economist, who, who went and did interviews, not himself, but with groups, with 35,000 families in India, Peru, South Carolina, and found out that um, poverty is not a static situation. People now in America have tumbled into poverty, who never were. Attorneys, people have lost their houses. It's not just the poor in the third world, but there are people, there's a flow to this. There's a, there's a logic to it. And one of the most, and that's why I do this in terms of building capacity, because the same time we're moving people out of poverty through education, you're trying to prevent people from falling into poverty. And part of that is single women. One illness wipes you out. The breadwinner dies, you're wiped out. The mother dies in childbirth, forget it, everybody's doomed. So it, it really does talk about what we've been doing at HHF in a, in a, in a very interesting way. Okay. Okay. Feel free to stand up. On occasion. On occasion. So our building capacity is important because you can do one for one or one for thousands, and that's what public health is. And and you know, for a nurse, you can, it's amazing what an in, independent um, international public health nursing or international public health is because you're creating something where nothing existed before. So people do that in the States too. There's a certain problem or a certain thing that we identify. Um, we have the skills, certainly, and the guts to go out and create something where it doesn't exist. Okay, for child health, um, 
Well, this is old, but it does make a point that we, in a, in a you know, comparison of other villages that are not part of um, our organization, that we have reached herd immunity. You know what herd immunity is? Once you get 85% of vaccine coverage, you're pretty much wiping out you know, a, a disease. So that's really a big deal. And that kids are weighed, and women are, you know, women are vaccinated, and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, that's a pretty big deal. Education, as always, this is nursing too, the foundation of change is education. And it's not just telling people what to do. Because if somebody told me, if you just lost weight, you wouldn't have high insulin level. It's like, yeah, no. You know, but, so we do it through songs and skits and uh, Te Monash, which is witnessing uh, a baby whose life was saved because of a certain intervention. Now this health agent, um, this health agent is singing, uh, I talked about vitamin A, singing about the foods that have vitamin A in them. But what you see is an old man singing the song, a mother and a child. It's based in the community, not just putting all the pressure on women where it always seems to be, but rather spreading that out and making the lives of children the responsibility of the whole community. So we have 50 or so songs and skits for AIDS, for diarrhea, for, you know, we can even sing a song like that. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we have groups of children who are 8 to 12 who uh, are now, you know, learning how to wash their hands and clean their fingernails and how to make oral rehydration. And children have saved the lives of adults by saying, you know, Mom, this is how you make oral rehydration. So that's really fabulous. Okay, we have a big health program for many women and men. It's the only diploma they ever received because they've never been to school. So it's a very big deal. And Dr. Lowney, in his generosity, decided to give a gift to all these people who have been a part of this program. These are all the things we do for children. We are um, community-based and computerized, so we keep pretty good track of who's dying and who's being born. This is pretty important. The first cause of death in Haiti is pneumonia. It's not diarrhea, and it's certainly not AIDS. Everybody thinks everybody has AIDS in Haiti. What he's doing, what he's doing is he's using this timer that beeps at 60 seconds and counting the respiratory rate of this child using a World Health Organization algorithm, um, depending on how fast the child's breathing, it's diagnosed as bacterial pneumonia or something worse than that. So a health agent with a sixth grade education and 40 cents of cotrimoxazole, a Bactrim, and a, an algorithm to diagnose and treat has saved the lives of 80,000 children and so after 17, it was all computerized, and I kept track of everybody, we counted every pill. Because health agents in Haiti aren't supposed to have antibiotics because, you know, uh, abuse and, and um, resistance forming. So after we had 17,000 cases, we, um, I called the CDC. I'm like, hello? I'm like, who are you? I said, I'm nobody, but you've got to come down here and see what these village health workers have done. And in fact, Two experts came from the respiratory division of the Centers for Disease Control, and we're the only place in the world that has reduced the death rate from pediatric pneumonia by 50% by training village health workers how to diagnose and treat. That's huge. That is a big deal. That is a big deal. And now 80,000 cases hence, we are the national trainers for pneumonia in the field and hope to um, continue to cement this as something that can be done in the villages to save the lives of children. We also use a standard pediatric protocol, and if any of you go overseas and are pediatrician, pediatric people, you need to know about this integrated management of childhood illness, um, because it's just a good head-to-toe illness form, and it's a uh, standard. Breastfeeding, you know. When I got to Haiti, everybody bubble fed because they wanted to be like Americans, you know. And the biggest obstacle, in fact, to getting women to reestablish breastfeeding as a child nutrition issue was nurses and doctors who all bottle fed. I want to slap everyone. Well, we found a way to get around that. Um, being in nursing school, I never learned really about breastfeeding. So when I went to Georgetown to be trained as a lactation consultant, you know, when I had a baby, my husband had to teach me how to breastfeed. Because my mother, who was a nurse, they gave pet milk and carol syrup in the 50s. No, I mean, that was it, didn't. Anyway, 
So we reestablished breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding for all mothers. We reached a critical mass of a thousand women, and then it took off on its own. So um, we've had fabulous success doing things like the belly, the belly balls. We got every, everybody in every church and synagogue in America to send down breastfeeding bras and clothes. We held uh, early on. We held fashion shows, for breastfeeding clothes. Because women would have a shirt like this in church, you know, and they pull out their breasts all the way down here and breastfeed during church. I'm like, I, I, no, no, no. And they were so impressed that Americans made bras and clothes for breastfeeding that it kind of upped the ball. And when women came in from the earthquake, having had such trauma, women were able to help women to reestablish breastfeeding. So it was really a big deal. And what we've done is we've pushed back malnutrition. We can't stop malnutrition. We're not creating jobs, but you can certainly push it back and delay the birth of the next child. So we have the highest rate in the country. It's one of the highest rates I've ever seen of documented exclusive breastfeeding. It's really good. Even though mothers are malnourished, they produce enough. Now, these poor kids are by, born behind the eight ball. So, you know, we have a deficiency of fish. So we're you know, missing iodine. Now we have iron deficiency anemia. Now, what I didn't know, maybe you know this, but um, it's Professor Stoltzfus from Cornell came down and said, you know, a lot of your kids are really um, anemic, and for a child to get enough iron in their diet in a country that's non-fortified, they have to eat as much as a male adult. And of course, Haitian kids can't do that. So we had this big, you know, fundraising thing for vitamins, which we still do, to give them iron, iron and uh, vitamins with iron. We do not have a lot of hookworm, which is a often seen as a cause of anemia. What I didn't know as a nurse was that um, anemia creates mental and physical delays. I thought it just makes you tired. No, if you're a child, mental dullness and physical developmental delays. So another thing we have, we have to worry about. Most Haitians eat one meal a day. I talked about that before. Iron deficiency. There we go. Because the fish are not there, and because Haitians don't use um, iodized rock salt, I mean iodized salt, but rather they use regular rock salt that they mine in Haiti, they wash the food with the salt and throw it away. The, the upside of that is 10% um, endemicity of women with goiters, and that's just the most observable effect, but more importantly is mentally dull children and um, miscarriages. So it's a real problem. It's a real problem. So what, although when I ask women, Haitian women, what's the cause of these big necks, and they say, it's just because they were straining when they were in labor. <laughs> and they pushed it out. <laughs> no, that's not it. Because men don't usually get boys, it's women. And the more pregnancies you have, the bigger it gets. So you can go walking around here and pick out the boys. How are you? We have a malnutrition program that's really good, and that's with Devin right now. Um, well, there's two general types of malnutrition. One is called marasmus, the other is quadruple. Um, marasmus is just a, not getting enough calories, just not enough calories to, to sustain a healthy body weight. Um, the HHF has a quadruple center, and the quadruple is a type of malnutrition where either you're not child is not receiving enough protein in their diet, or their body is not properly um, using the protein that they are getting in their diet. So it's a really interesting disease, I mean, disease mostly because not only because of the physical appearance of it, but also because of there's a huge psychosocial component to, um, well, all types of monotrition, but especially the quashia report, it seems. So there's a lot of not only the, um, you know, the physical rehabilitation, there's also a lot of work with the family and the care whoever the caregiver is and um, sometimes the siblings too to reestablish a healthy relationship, you know. Yes, and, and Devin did a fabulous job at running this program and then um, worked very hard to train a Haitian nurse that's able to run it by herself now, including her own reports and pie diagrams. The Center of Hope Nutrition Pavilion was opened in 2002. When I first got to Haiti, I said, we're not going to help the American farmer because, you know, imported food is not good. Well, that was really stupid because there's not enough animal protein in that the country has access to to get over malnutrition. So we really like it when we get soy, you know, soy burger and tuna fish, jerky up tuna fish drugs. 
you just can't get enough. So we work with Catholic Relief Service and other donors to get as much food into children as possible to push back malnutrition. We have urban, urban and rural programs. We try to use local whenever we can. Um, communities themselves get together with the children who are malnourished. That's our new sister, Angelie. Remember when you finish planting in America, it's just when you start planting. So people send in, you know, tomatoes and beans and all kinds of stuff. We give it to mother's clubs so they can make community gardens. The next generation, this is where, you know, this is where the is going to come in. Um, we did a lot of work with mothers and certainly then with fathers. And then it became apparent that we needed to engage youth even more um, to build them a better AIDS-free Haiti. So we did. Oh, how did that happen? I go back to where I was. Good. Hit like 20, hit a number 20, and then enter, and it'll go to slide 20 or um, find out where you were. Oh. Okay. Technology. Mm -hmm. Anyways, really, really important. First of all, girls aren't ever allowed to play soccer for the most part in Haiti. Because their breasts will fall down, they'll never get married, and you know, boys won't like them. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. So the first time I went to the mountains, we saw girls playing soccer. They, they were barefoot. They had a rock tied up with um, string, a rock with you know material, twelve tied up, and that's what they were playing with. Do you believe it? And so, and at the same time, we were doing a, a responsible sexuality course that does anatomy, physiology. Fertility awareness, planning your life, negotiation skills, and just saying, no, you are not a plaything for any Haitian guy. So um, we've been doing that for a long time. But then we decided to put it together with soccer. So if you go to this five-day five training and you pass the post-test, and we're not screwing around, we've got pre-test, post-test, then you're up for a girls' health day, which is where we do all this great um, health stuff just for teenage girls, and then they can play soccer. Uh, and then we have a road to health card just for girls that has their blood pressure. You know, they start knowing what blood pressure is because hypertension is a big problem. We check them for anemia, give them vitamins, make sure they have the vaccines and stuff. And then you have no idea how good this is. Okay. <coughs> because it's just such a great program. Okay. Um, so what we did, I kind of went down and worked on this program most of what I did was computer things like that. We had our full Haitian staff that kind of took care of the girls, ran the trainings, you know, organized and coached and taught. Um, and that was kind of there to talk to donors, talk to the office in Connecticut. But what we really did was, um, like Betty said, we had girls' health days, and after that, that follows like this health training on um, STIs and responsible sexuality. And as you kind of heard, there's kind of these beliefs that, you know, you know, goiters from pushing the video, or like you're going to get an STI from, from sitting on a hot rock, or like if you're hot and you eat something cold, you know, you get these diseases. And so it's kind of teaching them, no, it's, you know, it's from sex, it's, this is how it happens. Um, and so ways, you know, negotiation skills, ways to avoid that. And um, so after this training, you do a girls' health day where they, um, uh, do like weight, you know, check for anemia, things like that, make sure they're healthy, and then they can spend their summer being on a, like in a soccer league, where they kind of, one, are being active, and they have like this team camaraderie and um, women's empowerment, but also they're tired, they're not going out at night and getting STIs and things like that, um, which is just important. Um, but... It was really kind of neat working with all the girls and the different team members, like seeing everyone um, kind of lift up the girls. You know, once they did learn that you know their boobs aren't going to fall down, they're not going to have issues with that. It was kind of really cool to see the girls uh, working together and for each other to be on a team and take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we had one of our um, volunteers who actually worked with Dr. Um, Judy Lewis at the medical school and did an evaluation of, of the impact of this program. Um, we thought maybe a couple people would come and watch these girls. I am telling you, these were packed. We also used it as an opportunity to help education for um, early pregnancy prevention, helping people that had AIDS, destigmatization, all kinds of good messages, and just, um, you know, waiting. 
Now, there are no, there are no trophies in Haiti for um, girls. None. So, and that was kind of hurtful. So we called everybody we knew everywhere to send all their girl trophies. Doesn't matter what it was, basketball, you know, track, you know, it doesn't matter, skating, I think that's a skating though. Isn't that skating? <laughs> it doesn't matter, but look at how, look at how happy she is. This team won, and so everybody on the team gets a trophy, and then they get a ribbon, and all this stuff is donated, the balls, the, the um, Kathy, where are you, Kathy? Kathy yeah. sent me a new University of Connecticut School of Nursing t-shirts for one team. So, and we have like as many as 50 teams playing and number four balls, and it's a really big deal. And so people adopt these, I mean, we can't write letters back about that, but, you know, they send stuff to Norwich and it goes, new soccer shirts and shorts and pennies or whatever those are, it's not play soccer. But, you know, the amount of self-esteem building that this has done has been amazing. So let's see, look at the impact of this one little study of uh, 1,700 girls, and because we're all computerized again, we can keep track of everybody's pregnancy rates. Um, and so we found out that compared to the national average, and girls in HHF who didn't have the sexuality training or play soccer, there was a significant reduction in deliveries of, of, of teenage girls, which is just fabulous. Now off to women, almost done. First cause of death in women, uh, bleeding. And I talked to you about the thing we do, the education we do for severe bleeding, uh, retained placenta. You know, women come into the center of hope with a hemoglobin of four. You know, severe, severe anemia problem. Most births are at home, which is why I really like shower curtains. I did this lecture in in, uh, in uh, Minnesota, and I, had, I asked the concierge for a shower curtain. She said, like, there's one. I said, no, 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 I did it. And I brought it, and I was talking to this big, huge group, and I said, just like these other props, this shower curtain saves lives because you spread it on the ground so women don't deliver in the dirt. So, these are traditional birth attendants who are also mostly voodoo priests. Importantly, men deliver babies in Haiti. You think it's always granny midwives, but a lot of them are men, and many of them are voodoo priests. So, again, a strong collaboration with them, and we were with well over 300. This was an ambulance when I first came to Haiti. Can you imagine hemorrhaging, being carried by your neighbors, everybody following you in the village? Birth, death, everything is in your face in Haiti. Nothing happens behind closed doors. Um, and that actually makes the sense of community much stronger. AmeriCares, um, which is in Stanford, delivered, uh, donated to us our most recent obstetrical emergency vehicle. It's for women only. So we can get down that maternal death rate because once a mother dies, the babies are not far behind, either malnourished or dead. The hospital is a mess. Look at that 1929 delivery bed. You know, I'd rather deliver not there. So only 20% of women deliver in the hospitals because and not too much fun. And you're laying there naked, you know, no stirrups. You know, the baby goes in a you know five gallon spackle bucket, you know. Dr. Bordeaux there is, these are what we do for women. We have a really robust maternal child transmission prevention program, lots of breastfeeding support. Um, we go out into the villages and do all these, um, what's called rally posts. They're like health fairs. You know, different sections are set up for vaccines and registration, weighing babies and stuff, consultation. We have Katie's first maternal waiting foyer based on the model of Cuba, which has 300 of these for pregnant women where they get good care and a good rest once in their life and to be close to the hospital. That's Sister Sophie up there with a portable $20,000 sonogram machine looking for the placenta previa. And uh, uh, after that was in the dark, almost in the dark, it's the flash that makes it look like there's light in there. Haitian women stay at home with their ears um, plugged up, covered by, um, again, which one? Kerchief, long sleeves and stuff, so bad vapors don't get into their body. So to get women out of the home with their newborn within 10 days is a radical change in the cultural norm. But we've done that by getting community members to accompany women in. We give a food a ration to women who come in because, again, postpartum uh, death is the highest um, uh, rate. And again, help them with immediate breastfeeding. So this woman you see from the village, she's all protected from the bad airs. But anyway. We have great um, success with getting women out of the home and into care. We are part of the surveillance system for the Centers for Disease Control and the Government of Haiti for pregnant women by keeping track of um, using 400 women um, every one of these years. 
to look at what the story is. So when the Hilton Fund for Sisters came and said, Sister Marianne, I want to do AIDS, she said, we're not going to do AIDS, we're going to do syphilis. So we became one of the early programs to actually go out to the villages and look for syphilis in pregnant women, treat the babies for congenital syphilis, which we have a very high rate in Haiti, and uh, get the partners at the top. That's up there doing syphilis and anemia, family planning, the highest rate is separate provera, uh, highest use. We use lactation and amenorrhea and breastfeeding. And women are uh, marginally, are, they're not marginally, they're really, uh, malnourished and they have low muscle to fat ratio, so they're not ovulating a whole lot. Relief and development, again, feeding local when we can, building flour mills to <coughs> convert local food for consumption. Thank God solar power became easy, easy and this is an organization that sends them in suitcases. We have the headlamps which make all the difference in the world in a delivery or a child with pneumonia. We take the local attorneys out into the village and speak in Creole about human and reproductive rights. The village themselves identify a poor family with land papers. We raise the money for a happy house and everybody wins. Sister Marianne has built well over 50 houses for the poor, destitute, tuberculosis, blind, elders. They took a slum downtown and converted it. 50 houses now. Put 1,600 kids in a school that never would have it. She knows every name, every kid, with school supplies. This is a casket-making place that took in street children until someone came down and said, let's build a school. And this became the school that took in the kids after the earthquake. Dr. Lowney has given raise for the GOAT program. The people that got those diplomas for that health program gave them GOATs. We have a shop for people to support local artisans, which is important, microenterprise. Then the earthquake hits, which is really bad. You know, 300,000 people died in 53 seconds. Very, very traumatic. And everyone lost somebody. A nurse came for a job um, in, in Jeremy after the earthquake, and I said, well, you we were in Jer at Port of France, what happened? She said, her entire family was crushed right in front of her. They picked up their body in a, in a payloader and put it in a dump truck. I'm like, well, do you want like a little time off? Do you like, want some drugs, counseling? She said, no, I have to, I have to go on. Couldn't believe it, the, the strength of the conditions. They came in 8,000 at a time. We were both there. I should have some of those slides. We were all there receiving them. When they did loot in Port-au-Prince, they looted to get toothpaste to put under their nose to stench the smell of rotting bodies. And when they arrived on shore, everybody sang the national anthem and cried. And people said, home never smells so good. There were no ten cities in Jeremy because everybody went home. They gave what they could. And HHF, in turn, responded uh, ER nurse over there was running the ambulance for the hospital, and I was doing the OB. Um, we gave out food again. We're computerized. We registered every new person. Uh, a lot of women suffered um, from the migration. A lot of people out of school. There was a tremendous impact, of course, on health, and that's why we're training new health agents. Oops. We start Sister Mary and started a whole other session at school for these children. We, we 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 dealt with the woman who came in and the woman who received her family, right? But we gave them um, a micro enterprise so that they both benefited from one taking in the other. Uh, and in, then there's cholera. Then there's cholera, which sliced through the country just like that. And we're done to go. A lot of people, a lot of deaths. Terrible. People died in uh, six hours of massive diarrhea, bucketfuls, and it's not diarrhea, it's water. It's like it was printed out a bathroom faucet. Yeah, that's yes. like. Lots of education, massive. So what we've done overall are these things. We've had some great successes. We have some fabulous challenges still. And I challenge you to what you'll do in your life and how it will help others. <laughs>